thank you everyone for turning out on election night. You look like a responsible crowd, so I'm sure you have all voted. If you have not, we will get you out of here in time to vote. So don't think that coming to see Stan gets you out of your civic responsibility. My name is Rob Klein. I'm the host of Oral Histories Live here at the History Center. This program is generously supported by Mike Wilson. So if you would help me thank Mike, who is hiding here somewhere. Mike, where? where ah, there he is. Usually, as you may know, Mike sits in the front so that he can give me the stink eye if I'm doing a bad job. <laughs> Tonight, as a special bonus, my wife and parents are sitting in the front row. <laughs> so anything could happen. Tonight, our guest is my dear friend and a man I deeply admire, both artistically and just as, you know, a general human being, the great Stan Wiederspan. But before I, yes, please welcome him. <laughs> Before I let him tell you stories, I'm going to tell you a story. When a good portion of your income comes from freelance work, you learn to say yes, even if you don't know how to do the thing. For example, a guy in a bow tie might say, hey, we're doing an oral histories program. Would you be the host? And you say, Yes, and then you figure out how to be the host. Now, probably close to two decades ago, I was doing a lot of freelance art reviewing. I liked to say at the time, I still like to say, I may have been the only colorblind art critic in America which is not the qualification you might think it is. And one day, they, they, probably Icon, maybe the Gazette, someone asked me to go to Stan Wiederspan's gallery to write about the show that he had there. I didn't know Stan, I didn't know his gallery, uh, and if I'm being honest, I didn't really know anything about the visual arts either. And there was abstract work on display, and I thought, oh boy, I'm in trouble, right? I know a lot about the performing arts. I don't know a lot about the visual arts, but I said yes. And so I said to Stan, here's what I'm trying to write. I could use your insight. I have never gotten a better lesson from any teacher at any time in my entire life. He changed my understanding of the visual arts in his gallery that day while I was just trying to figure out how to make my deadline. And so I cannot tell you how excited I am to have him here today. I also should tell you that the more I admire the guest, the more nervous I get. I am so nervous. <laughs> So bear with me tonight. Stan, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stan, uh, we talked the other day, so you know the drill. We're going to start at the very beginning. You grow up in Nebraska, which we don't hold against you. Yes, I, I yeah, yes. <laughs> Please confirm or yes, deny. That's yes. <laughs> All right. You grow up in Nebraska. You go to Hastings College. Is that right? Correct. OK. So I liked how you said this to me the other day. You, uh, you graduated, and you, faced, uh, you were faced with the decision of all college graduates, which was? Well, what, what am I going to do now, you see? And he had a, he, as you might imagine, he'd been an art major. He had his teaching certificate. And there was a place that needed someone like you. Yes, I, I began looking around. and. In the little hamlet of Britt, Iowa, which is Hobotown, uh, they were looking for an art teacher, which, you know, today they're probably getting rid of all of them, but they, at that time they w were looking for an art teacher and they were play paying an extra salary bonus just to attract an art teacher. And I said, oh, here I am. <laughs> and so I moved to Britt, stayed there for three years. Wonderful years. He put it to me that he fell for the incentive. I did. <laughs> that was it. 
I think it was like $400 extra. I said, fine, I'll take it. That seems like a reason. You say yes. Someone asks you to do something, you say, Absolutely. you say yes. OK, so you're there for three years. And are you teaching high school? Yes. Uh, well, basically, it was a small school. So it was junior and senior high combined. But it, it was the idea behind it was that they, they did not have an art department. And so it was the opportunity to start an art department. And um, they didn't even have a room equipped that way. We had to run across the hall to the bathrooms to, to use the sinks, you know, to, to wash brushes and things. But that was fine. We, we did that. And um, they put in a couple of metal big cabinets. We got along fine. In little bitty Brit, Iowa. But after three years, what, what made you decide to, to leave Brit? Well. Three years was enough. <laughs> uh, and and I, I realized that I could pump myself up on the salary schedule if I got a master's degree. So I, I then went to the University of Iowa and stayed two years, did an MA and an MFA with the intention of returning to high school teaching somewhere. Uh, but one of the profs came by one day and said, how would you like a, a college teaching job? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Stan is a very agreeable guy. Offer him $400, he'll teach in Brit. Tell me about getting an MA and an MFA at Iowa. How long does that take? What, and what is the difference between those two degrees? Well, many schools don't separate them. Iowa separates them, so you do a separate MA, and then you can apply, and if you're accepted, do an MFA. Uh, so that's the way I heard. Uh, are you asking what was the experience like? Yeah, in the in, in that Iowa program, that sort of legendary Iowa art program. It was. I found it extremely challenging, and. Um, you go through re reviews, you periodically have to appear before the faculty and set all your work out in front of them and leave the room. And they, it's like a court martial, they look at the work and evaluate it and decide whether they'll allow you to continue. And you have two chances. And if you fail the second one, you're out. Um, and uh, well, luckily I got through those and then what I was doing by MFA, uh, somewhere along the line, Frank Cyberling was head of the School of Art and Art History at that time. And he just looked at me, and the faculty sitting there, he said, Mr. Winterspan, we don't think you know what art is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been teaching art in high school. And, and, but he was absolutely right. Uh, I had not matured to understand what he meant by that comment, but that was right. And I, in, in all honesty, I have spent the rest of my career in life trying to deal with what, what is that? What is that thing we call art? And uh, so, uh, luckily I made it through a second review and, and got the degree. Uh, so I, and one of the most interesting ones, Maurizio Losansky was on the, still on the faculty at that time, and uh, was in one of the classes. And he would take the students individually out in the corridor, spread out your work, and he would review it and critique it. And one day he shook his little finger at me and he said, why don't you draw the way you were drawing when you were 14? And again, I thought, well, what does that mean? And he was telling me, do not try to look like Picasso or any artist that you admire. Try to be you. It's your drawings, it's your prints that I'm interested in seeing. And many times I use that example when I was teaching and I would hold up a book and I would say to the students, pretend this is an art history book. 
And if I open it up, you'll see that all the pages are empty because they're waiting for you to do your work so they can put it in the pages. So do not try to be Picasso. Do not try to be Nolan Rockwell. Don't try to be any other artist. It's fine to admire them. It's fine to learn from them. But we're interested in seeing exactly what you can do, just like your signature. So I'm not sure I learned a lot at Iowa, but there are those things that certainly marked the experience there. Absolutely. And including the professor who said, hey, how would you like a, a college teaching job? Yeah, exactly. That job turned out to be at Iowa Wesleyan in the beautiful town of Mount Pleasant. You were there for eight years. Yes. And I, <laughs> I liked how you put this the other day, too. He called them wonderful, glorious, happy, tenured years. <laughs> there was quite an emphasis on tenured. So tell us a little bit about teaching at Iowa Wesleyan. Well, um, it was a small department. I was a, a second addition to it and um, handled drawing, painting, uh, art history. And um, anyone who has been on a college faculty knows the joy of being, you know, on a college campus. And uh, uh, there were interesting incidents. That was during the Vietnam War era. Uh, we, there was a, the night that we had the riots on campus. Uh, that concluded in, in a most interesting way. There were other incidents that happened. Uh, so it was, it was just a glorious, glorious experience. And all during that time I continued to, to paint, uh, maintain the studio and continue to paint. And uh, it, yeah, I, I, I admire it and often wondered if it was a good idea to have left it, particularly because I had the ten, tenure. Uh, but the day came when uh, uh, an opportunity presented itself and I, I left the college. Remember how we've already established that it doesn't take much to get Stan to agree to something? So if my notes are right, you were at the State Arts Council meeting. Yes. A friend of yours, remind me who? Rich Williams, who was the conductor of the Cedar Rapids Symphony at that time, was also on the State Arts Council. And at a meeting one day, he said, by the way, Stan, Don Young, the director of the Cedar Rapids Arts Center, has resigned. Why don't you apply for the position? And I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, my life is, has really been like a steel ball and a pinball machine. I, I just sort of bounce around. Uh, but so I applied for the position and I got hired and left Mount Pleasant, came to Cedar Rapids. It was the largest town I'd ever lived in. I thought it was interesting and exciting. And so I was here, and I don't want to jump onto your <laughs> You're very kind to, to give me some space. I appreciate it. Uh, the, for the folks in the audience who maybe don't remember the Art Center, yes. what was its, well, first, where was it? What was its purpose, and what did it grow into over time? Well. You, you have to sort of go back to a bit of history behind the whole thing. It was around the turn of the century in 1900 that a group of people in Cedar Rapids decided to have an art club. So they, they got together for an art club. About 10 years later, they incorporated into the Cedar Rapids Art Association. And then in the 20s and 30s, or 30s and 40s, that's when Marvin Conan and Grant Wood were involved in, in the Art Center, and they were using what's now the auditorium in, in the old library. That's where they held exhibits and, and various activities. And so eventually then, I think it was in the 1960s, that uh, 
they acquired the uh, Torch Press Building, which is on 3rd Street, 4th Avenue. Uh, and it's where the Cedar Rapids Foundation is housed now. So that was uh, three floors of gallery, fourth floor, uh, we turned into studios. Am I getting ahead of you? No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to wreck your story. No, no, this is this is well, your anyway, show, Stan. I'm just I'm just you, here to balance out the look. Well you asked the question of what was it about. I, I uh, they had acquired began acquiring artwork and so they they wanted to have a place where they could exhibit it and they had gotten a number of original Grantwood pieces. And so the third floor uh, was designated as the Grantwood Gallery. And it was just opening when I arrived on the scene. Uh, and so uh, beyond that, uh, I, I, I actually think at that time, other than paying attention to the arts and doing some exhibits, they, they didn't have a particular definition of where they wanted to be, but they used the term art center. Now the Des Moines Museum is, is also the art center, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an art museum. So it, it, there's a sort of am, ambiguity but we were the art center. And what I interpreted that to mean, and what I approached the job for, was we could, we could have exhibits, but we could have classes. And so we began a lot of classes for adults, and we had an association with the School of Art and Art History from the University of Iowa to fabricate kids' classes, and we, we used all sorts of fucking names like cream soda drawing class or popsicle painting, you know, to get the kids going. And so we turned the fourth floor into studios, had a lot of adult painting activity, some evening activity. And so my, my concept was that as an art center, it, it had to provide services for the community and be part of it. And because the, the art association still existed at that time, when we had the annual meeting, I expected people to come. I expected the art association to be there. And a handful would show up. And finally I said, I will pay one dollar to every person who shows up for the art. And we, we did it, we got a few people there. But in the, at that time, the board sort of took care of things. And, and they ran it, and then I was supposed to do the programming, and, and that's the way it went. And I think after the Art Center became the Art Museum, then it, it evolved into a whole new, totally uh, different idea. Okay, so the years we're talking about here are 1973 to 1978. And in 1978, I'm sure that they were very nice people on the board of the Art Center at the time. Uh, but I feel antipathy toward them <laughs> because they came to you and they said, Stan. I can't open this thing. No, that's not what they said. I'll open that. You tell the people <laughs> <laughs> what the board members said to you in 1978. Well, we had a, a meeting and, and got together to de decide what the staff salaries would be. And instead they said, we're not renewing your contract. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> no, we're not renewing. They, they said it in a much kinder way. What they said, and which is correct, we have decided what we need to do for the, for the future of the Art Center is, is have a director prepared and interested in fundraising, which is absolutely correct. That's what they needed. And so we want to 
find a director that's doing that. But it was very cordial. They said, take time and finish any projects you're working on. When you get those done, let us know, and then we'll make the transition. And so, in effect, I got fired, uh, but for good reason. Now, the problem was that the job description in the first place never mentioned the, the aspect of, of fundraising, and it certainly wasn't anything I was interested in or prepared for. Uh, and so, I should have never applied. They should have never hired me. But we all learn and move on. And so uh, I, I, I left after five years. <clears throat> and at the time, it was a devastating psychological blow. I was about 40 years old and, and moving up in my career. And I thought, the, you know, I, I completely failed. I mean, here I got dumped. Now what? Well, the answer to that was, I set up my studio in my house and I began painting full time because that's about the only other thing I knew how to do. Uh, and so I did that for a period of 13 years. And I think this is, well, first, if the board said to me, let us know when your projects are done and then we'll make the transition, I'd still be working there. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record. Uh, but secondly, when you did leave, you, you did set up your studio, as you say, but you also applied for a bunch of teaching jobs. But you had an interesting sort of personal rubric about these well, jobs. Well, I still have family living in Nebraska, and I, I, I thought that I needed to be with an easy day's drive of getting back, uh, particularly uh, because my mother, <clears throat> mother was still living and I, I needed to be around that. And so I'd apply for these jobs and then I'd get invited for the interview and I'd say, yeah, on second thought, no. And I, the, most, the most embarrassing one was I was invited and I, I still don't understand it. I can't imagine I ever applied for the job. But I got invited to be director of, of education at the Chicago Art Institute. You know, I, you don't even want to ask. <laughs> they did I, not offer him a $400 incentive. That's all we're saying. <laughs> that was a, it's a cheap, you know. OK, so you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to move. I'm going to not take another teaching job. I'm going to set up the studio. I'm going to paint. Uh, you do that for 13 years. Let's, I, I'm interested in two pieces of this. One is, let's talk about the galleries that represented you over that period of time and how you got to be working with them. But I, I also think it might be a good moment to talk about the breadth and scope and variety of your work. You do a lot of different things really, really well. I don't know if you knew that, Stan. You're a really good painter. And I'm interested in the, yeah, in the variety of your work and, and where that impulse comes from. Well, one answer to your question is that uh, I, I had to uh, paint and generate income, obviously. And so, like any other business, uh, you have to diversify in, in order to keep things moving along. And so, uh, I, I painted a great many landscapes, and I love, love painting landscapes, and, and still periodically do. Uh, but I, I then began doing a variety of other things and when opportunities presented themselves, uh, I said, hey, I can do that. And so if it, if it was a place, uh, perhaps a business that wanted a lobby painting, uh, maybe they suggested something adventuresome, hey, I can do that. And so I just took off and did that. And that was a learning experience because some opportunities uh, seemed limited in the beginning, but ended up being pretty adventuresome. And then I, I got to do a, a large piece. And uh, 
several galleries were representing me. Certainly, the original Corner House Gallery with Janelle and, and uh, uh, George McLean began handling my work and, and selling them, and that was extremely helpful. A gallery in Moline began handling the things. Uh, I think that was about the main ones. So it's a combination of galleries uh, finding opportunities and then uh, just sort of finding opportunities myself. And I don't think of myself as an aggressive person, but yet I found that uh, I was recognizing opportunities and I went after it. That was, am I getting into your part of the story again? No, no, you're doing just fine, you're doing well, just fine. One example was that I walked into the relatively new airport and, uh, and I just stood back and sort of looked around and it was, uh, the walls were painted a, a soft sort of blue-gray and the carpeting and, and the upholstery, everything matched it. And I th thought, this is really nice, but it is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> and so I walked around and I found five walls in the place that were totally blank. And I thought, well, here are five opportunities. And so I set about doing my homework, checking with the airport commission to see if they'd be interested in a proposal. They said they would. So I came up, uh, interviewed with them, and, and designed scale models to show them what I had in mind. They gave me the commission to do it, and so uh, I, I did the, the paintings that uh, were in the airport for a very long time. As an aside, just a second, those over time, as, as they remodeled the airport, those paintings were taken out and put into storage until a couple of years ago when uh, the new city services building on 6th Street Southwest called and said those paintings are now are going to be reinstalled in their new building and they need to be cleaned and retouched and could I take care of that? Yes, of course. So I did that. Uh, they paid me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and so the, those paintings are in the, in the building and they, they almost look better there than they did at the airport. The biggest one is 25 feet. It was 25 feet, 20 feet, 15. And then there were two pieces that were four by five feet rectangles. And so all of those, well, actually, the 15 foot one stays, and it's still there as far as I know, in the administration building at the airport. Mm. But anyway, that was a project that I just saw an opportunity and went after. Now, there's a follow-up story to that that really is important in regard to the whole life of art in Cedar Rapids. A lot of artists got really upset that that project occurred the way it did. They were upset that they did not have the opportunity to also present ideas, and, and it's correct, rightfully so but it was not my job to find jobs for them. <laughs> my response at the time was, the front door was open, you could have walked in, and if you had the idea and the inspiration, you could have gone after it. I did, I got the commission, thank you. <laughs> no, no. He's just but, a freelancer but, at heart, right? But I, uh, there's a follow-up, yeah, follow up yet to that, I think as a result of a bit of the controversy that, that came about because I got the commission, the, the Cedar Rapids Art, Fine Arts Commission was established to deal with situations like that. Um, back, to the, back to the way I got the job, 
no, no public tax money was used. The, the money that was used for that commission was from the airline user fees of the airport. So it was not tax monies used. And then, so that made a little bit of difference. And I think the commission felt they could be free. But then the commission was established, and I think the commission has done a great deal of work to get public art around the city. I served on it for a while, and now it's, it's evolved, and I'm not sure I completely understand. There's, there still is the commission, but, but much public art now seeks artists through an agency in Denver I call it CAFE. And so artists send their resumes to that thing, to that agency. Uh, and they're on file, and in turn, if, if you're accepted, you get notices of projects that are soliciting for artists, and then you can have your credentials sent to those projects. And in some way, I don't know whether the agency in the first place weeds artists out. I, I don't know how that works. Uh, but anyway, so, so it, it's gone to a much better, bigger scale. Recently, one of our local artists said to me, I, I, wish, I wish local artists had more opportunities to do some of these pro projects around town. You have, all of our local artists have the opportunity to simply put their credentials into the, the bin and they compete with everybody else. Now, having said that, I agree I think local artists should have the opportunity to do some of these projects. I remind them, go out and find the projects you want to do and create the project for yourself. But at the same time, by using these agencies, we're not limited to having local artists, and the city has the opportunity to bring new art in by other artists from all over. And, and that, that agency handles internationally artists. So, and this is a good point to say, I, I am so excited about the murals that are going up in town. I'm not sure I've seen all of them, but the ones I've seen are just outstanding. So uh, whoever is behind that, boy, I applaud them. I'm not sure whether it's a single agency. I, I, I'm just in, not in touch with who is doing all that. But they're extremely beautiful and, and well done. And so the point of all that is, is one thing sort of led to another. And, and so the city is much better off now. Ta-da. <laughs> Thank you, and good night. No. Um, <laughs> So another piece of that story, right, is how interwoven into our civic life Stan's work is, right? It's at the airport for many years. I don't know if it still is. It was at the, the place I will always call the Five Seasons Center, right? It is on the cover of the 100th year brochure for this, sorry, I'm an old guy, for Orchestra Iowa, right? And it is undeniably Stan's work, <coughs> right? You, are, are you coughing because you don't want to take credit for that work? No, but, but <laughs> I thought you were going to mix, I thought you were going to talk about the mural that was in the Five Seasons <clears throat> Center, and then you slipped over to the symphony. Those are two different things. Yes, those are absolutely two different things, oh, yeah, yes. Okay. Yes, my only point was that it's all your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, the, the piece that was at the Five Season Center, is it still at the Five Season Center? No, that, that mural was at the foot of the escalator. Right. Remember that big thing? That was another project. I was coming down the escalator after a rotary meeting one day and I looked at that wall and said, I, well, there is a nice wall, empty. <laughs> now, you, you might remember <clears throat> that there was a large painting at the foot of the escalators when the original five seasons opened. It was called The Wave. And uh, that was 
damaged. Uh, I don't know whether it was vandalism or what, but it was damaged. And it was eventually moved and moved to what was then the new library, the one that preceded our current new library. And it was, it was displayed in the, that outer kind of hallway. Right outside Beams Auditorium. Right, and then in, with the flood of 2008, I think it was damaged and I don't know what's happened. Does anyone know anything about it? Well, I, I think maybe it was destroyed mm. during the flood. But anyway, that wall was hanging, was, was standing empty. And again, I did my homework and went to the, the Five Seasons Commission and said, would you be interested in a project about putting in some artwork? And they said, yes. Once again, I did my, I made the scale models and went and presented it and uh, got, got the, pro oh, one other thing was that I was in Europe at the time and I ran into a friend of mine who happened to be in New York at the same time, we're both drinking beer at the same place. And I was just sort of discussing this idea that, that I think I want to try to do something at the five. And he said, if you do, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll help fund it. Hmm. And, oh, okay. <laughs> and so with that, my proposal to the city, con or to the Five Seasons Commission was, if you let me do it, I'll raise the money. <laughs> and so I, I, I financed the thing by, by raising money. Uh, and so it hung there until recently when they remodeled the Five Seasons. Then the, the City Fine Arts Commission called me and said, okay, we have to take this thing out. We need your advice on what do we do. And one of the provisions as the city, the Five Seasons Commission said, you can use the wall, but you cannot damage the wall, which meant that I guess I couldn't paint on it. In some way, I had to do something and apply it. And so what I ended up doing was, was all of the color sections were individual pieces, like jigsaw pieces, uh, separately painted and tacked with little finishing nails on that wall. And so when the five seasons wanted to take it out, all we did was take off the pieces. And they said, now what do we do with this? This is a piece of Cedar Rapids history. I said, throw it away. <laughs> really, I, and I was serious. I said, it is circus purpose. Where else is it going to go? It's tacky, it, it looks dirty, and because it had to be done in sections. I said, I have the designs. If you ever want to redo it, we can redo it. But I said, take these pieces and just dump them. And they said, well, I'm not sure if we can do that. And I have no idea what happened after that. <laughs> I, I think we've stumbled onto the title of Stan's memoir. Stan Wiederspan, Never Met a Wall He Couldn't Fill, I think is, is probably where we're headed. So well, there, it's very exciting to find a big empty wall someplace, you know, and uh, I admire these artists who are doing these, these murals. I mean, I, I wouldn't attempt one of those, uh, but uh, so I, I don't know how they're getting commissions, but more power to them. Okay, so you're painting at, in your home studio for 13 years. Janelle and some other galleries are, are supporting you, helping support your work. And to thank them, you decide to open your own gallery. <laughs> well, I, I, like, I like a gallery environment. Uh, I like arranging paintings. When I was at the Art Center, that was the most pleasurable thing I did, was get into the gallery when we had uh, an exhibition come in and arrange. Freddie Sker and I, he was... Uh, on the staff at that time, we would unload these crates and get all these paintings out and say, okay, now what do we do? You know, so you have to line these things up. And if it's an exhibit with a lot of diversified imagery, uh, then you have to figure out, okay, what looks good to, 
to what and when you walk in the door, what do you see there? And when you turn the corner, okay, what do we want over there? And it, it was really a joy uh, to, to do that kind of installations. And so uh, I sort of never got it out of my system and I liked doing that. And so one day I walked out of U.S. Bank and across the parking space, I saw a, one of the shops the windows were covered with brown paper. And something inside of me said, oh, there's, there's an opportunity. Why not open a gallery? And with more naivete than you could imagine, uh, I opened an art gallery. Now, you all know where that gallery was, right? Right along Mount Vernon Road next to a, what used to be a grocery store and is now a hardware store, not exactly visual arts row, right? But somehow a successful location for you for a, well, heck, for a quarter century, right? Moderately so. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but That's but it, it provided that, that opportunity for doing exhibits, and I loved that part of it. And uh, it, it became kind of a meeting place. I mean, the traffic, wasn't busy like high V for God's sake. There were days that went by that if the postman didn't come in, there was no reason for me to have been there, you know. Uh, but it, it, people start coming in, friends, and they would just pull up a chair and we would spend an hour just chatting. And it was wonderful, wonderful experience. That I really miss. And uh, some of the stories uh, were, were pretty heavy emotional stories that got told in there. So it all, almost became like a therapy <laughs> space. But I, I, I loved that very much, and I did it for 25 years. And finally, and the, the, the gallery picture changed, uh, and after 25 years, I said, okay, there's enough of this, and so I left that, closed it. So I'm gonna jump in with an, another story of my own, right? He's quite right that people, including your host, would come in and sit with him for an hour. One other person who used to do that is Jenny and my son, Brian, who would be fighting me to host tonight if he weren't in Champaign, Illinois, in graduate school. Brian would have been itty bitty, and he would come into the store with me, often on Saturdays while Jenny was teaching dance, and just sit and talk with Stan. And sometimes they'd include me too. Uh, <laughs> but those moments watching this artist and teacher talk to my little boy about art and about how he was interacting with the world, like I, I, think it, I don't think Brian would begrudge me saying this, our son loves you so much that he would have happily kicked me out of the gallery and just stayed there with you. Well, and he, Brian, gave me a watercolor painting, nicely framed, a little watercolor painting, which he had done, a beautiful little painting, which I still have and, and admire. He'll be relieved to hear. <laughs> well, so love him back. Okay, I will. <laughs> We also have, well, we're gonna talk about the boxes here, right? But I, before we talk about the boxes, I have a note, it's unlike any note I've ever written in preparation for these shows. Rob, there's a story I wanna tell and I'm not going to tell you in advance. Is usually I can't get people to stop telling me stories in advance, right? <laughs> Are we at the place in our event where you'd like to tell whatever story that is? I have no idea what I was talking about. I feel, Stan, that you have set me up. <laughs> no, I, 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 is that what I said, that I had a story? It's, so I have, here's what else I have on this point. It's a story about a high point that made all of the artistic work and time that you've spent in this community worthwhile to you. 
Well, I, I, I think I know what I was talking about. Uh, that will come after you discuss the boxes. I mean, it, it's, it's, part of, it's part of the box story. Okay, we're gonna talk about the boxes. Have you all seen the boxes, right? Yes, please, right? <laughs> There you go. You own the very first one. Yes. We bought the first box, Stephen and I. And I remember it. It's a beautiful one. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember Brian and I would have been going into the gallery, right? So I, we would have seen those very early. And I remember looking at those. I still look at them and think, he's painting cardboard boxes. <laughs> Why are they so damn good? So tell us a little bit about the impetus for the box paintings. Well, maybe I, I, lots of artists go through the same idea. You reach a point where you need a new idea. Okay, now what, what, you know, I, what, what am I going to put on that blank canvas? And because, as you pointed out, I do a lot of diversified things. Um, you know, okay, now, now what shall I do? So I was thrashing around trying to come up with an idea. And I was walking down the back corridor at the, at the building where the gallery was. And the lady on the end of a gift shop had tossed out some boxes that she had just received some merchandise in. She was uh, carelessly tossing them into the corridor at the moment. To, to be taken care of later. And I was headed down the corridor, and suddenly, it was an absolute epitome, epiphany. Those, is that the word? It yeah. is. Uh, seeing those boxes lying there, I said, my God, there it is, instantly. The emotion, the, I, I warn you, the you emotions did. come up. Yes, well, I almost cried about Brian, and now you're crying about the boxes. But I, I should say, how many of us have walked by cardboard boxes and have not thought, you know what I should do? I should paint those. <laughs> right? Right? There is the nature of an artist, right? Well, I, I, I told Rob when he was talking to me about doing this, I said, listen, my emotions these days are right on the service constantly. I don't know why, but, you know, just anything can, you know, it is, it, I think it's okay. So I mean, <laughs> throw myself on the floor, blow. Anyway, I, I knew that those boxes uh, was the new subject. So I hauled them into the studio, did an arrangement on the table with lighting, photographed it, got rid of the boxes, and did the first painting, which is a very large one, uh, uh, 54 by, I forgot the, the exact measure, anyway. And uh, I loved it. I, it was so much fun to paint it. And I had envisioned I'm going to paint this in oil because I envisioned dark colors. Um, but I actually ended up painting it in acrylic. All, all my work now is, is, is acrylic. And so I did that one. I thought, God, that was so much fun. Let's do another one. So then I did a second one, and then a third one. And I thought, I wonder if I could get to 10, and maybe I could get an exhibit somewhere other than my own gallery. Maybe I could, you know. And so I continued, and I, I got to 10. And along the way, and this is an important point for an artist, I said to myself, there is not a chance in hell that I'll sell one of these. Because who in the world, in their right mind, would buy a picture of a cardboard box? But the decision was, these are so entertaining to do, at this point in my life, I can afford to do it. I'm just going to do it. And so I, I just kept painting cardboard boxes. And as I did, I, I hung them out in the gallery just to get them out of the space. I, I hung them toward the back so the other artists had the front of the gallery. And people began to notice them and began to remark about them and began to return bringing someone 
to see the boxes. And uh, then uh, uh, the art, the, uh, yes, the art museum was about to have their annual gala. And so they sent a delegation to the gallery and said, we want one, one of your paintings. Uh, we want you to donate one of your paintings. To you make them sound so threatening, a delegation <laughs> well, <laughs> to coming to demand a donation. I embellished it. It was two ladies. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they, they wanted me to donate this painting. And, and I was just sort of in the throes of the whole thing, loving it, and, I, and, and in love with them. And I said, I'm not going to give you one of these. Well, they hounded me and hounded me, and I finally agreed, okay, I will do something, but I'm not gonna give you one of the paintings. And then a, the little guy on the shoulder pulled my earlobe and he said, the creme de la creme of, this, of the city is gonna be at that art gala, and you're not going to expose them to one of your paintings? Aha, uh -huh, you're right. So I reversed course, did a special, larger, really fine, I thought, better than any of the previous ones perhaps, and gave that to them. And it, it sold beyond anything I would have had imagined and set the benchmark for the cost of the, the price of the paintings. And then the art museum uh, said, we want to do a, an a exhibition of these. And so they scheduled a one-man show of the boxes, which perhaps some of you remember. Now the story, the high point that I was going to tell you, was one, one morning, on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, I had just opened the gallery, the phone rings, and a man on the other end says, be in New York tomorrow morning with your box paintings. Uh, we want to see them. Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is Ivan Karp from New York. We want to look at your paintings. Be in New York tomorrow morning and bring these paintings. Well, I'm in shock, and I say, well, no, I'm not coming to New York tomorrow. We're having a blizzard here, but I'll get there. Uh -huh. Here come the emotions. Uh, about two weeks later, I head to New York, and, and the walk from the subway station to the gallery to show them my paintings was the high point of my life. Sorry about that, but that's, you know. Um, so I walk into the gallery. Ivan Karp is there because me a big bear hug. Let's see your paintings. I had taken four. And I set them out. They said, okay, I want all of them. Well, you, no, you can't have these because I'm doing a show at the art museum and I have to take these home. You're not taking them. I'm, I'm, we're keeping these. We're, <laughs> We're doing a summer show, and these are going to be in the show. The guy on my shoulder said, are you telling an art gallery in New York that they cannot have your paintings? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can have three, but I have to take at least one back. So I, I took the one back, they kept the three, they opened the show, but before the show, they, Ivan Karp called and said, sorry about that, but all three of the paintings have already been sold. <laughs> he said, we'll, we'll, we'll have them in the show, but they've all been sold. So that, that, was, that sort of was the high point of the career. I yeah. remember from, yes, please. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I remember in those those early days of, of you painting those that, that you told Brian and myself that you were going to do 10. And then you did 10, 
And then I don't know how many more you did after that, but I learned never to trust your counting again. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, then, then, then the, the, the real high point of that whole story is that two years later, then they gave me a one-man show. So that I was in the group show, and, and, and as I say, those are all sold. And then I did a group show, and, and quite a number of those were sold, including to Ivan Karp, the, the director. Unfortunately, a few years later, he died, and the family closed the gallery. But it was down uh, on West Broadway in Soho, and as I say, the, the, just the idea that, that I was going to have an exhibit in New York of my paintings, uh, I, I mean, what more can you ask? So all those years ago, we started an art collection for Brian, local artists. We'd commission artists to make things for Brian. And of course, we couldn't afford Stan's fees. But fortunately, uh, you know, Brian was cute. <laughs> and so the centerpiece of his art collection is an offshoot of the box paintings that made from <laughs> cardboard and a label with your signature on it and the shadow and it's on a blue background. And so it's like the, it's like the secret stepchild of the box paintings and it hangs in our living room and Brian will try to get it someday. We'll see how he does. Um, now would probably be a good time to talk about the new box paintings. Something exciting is happening. Well, uh, a year ago, uh, Janelle, who's here, called and said uh, the, art, the uh, art museum is having a gala. Uh, <laughs> she said, could we have a box paint? <laughs> Well, it just happened that it caught me at a time where I was not doing anything. I mean, I, I, was, I had done a variety of paintings, a, a series of paintings, but I was thrusting around for an idea, and I, you know, and it caught me at a, a, a good time, and I said, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it. So I, I did that one, and 10, a total of 10 cents, uh, three have been sold, so there are, the others remain. And now Janelle has put together an exhibition which is going to open on December 1st, Thursday, December 1st. Uh, and the new box paintings will be on display in addition to some previous pieces that other than having been on display in my gallery, I think have not been displayed anywhere. So it's going to be a collection of 18, 18 new paintings. These will be in that wonderful lobby space in the CRST building, and it will be open, opens on Thursday night, uh, Janelle, I think, has some postcards uh, that I have one in my pocket, if I can get it out of my pocket, uh, that gives you the information. Uh, opens Thursday night, 5 to 8, and is open Friday, 5 to 8, and then Saturday, 10 to 4, and then open to the public, you're all invited. And then after that, it'll be open for a period of time by appointment. And Janelle is handling the whole routine. And uh, you have postcards. So anyone who wants a postcard to be reminded, uh, see Janelle. And so uh, here I am at my age, still painting. and yet doing another exhibition. Thank you. So She must have forgiven you for opening your own gallery. Yeah, you will. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a point where I'd like to inject something. I want to say something. 
Cedar Rapids, I think, is very rich in its art traditions. Uh, with all the new murals going up, uh, with all the art that we see throughout the community, and it's Janelle McLean who personally is, is responsible for a great deal of the growth of art in this town. She is the one uh, who has gone out to businesses and said, you need art, and I've got the art you need. She's the one who's contacted individuals. She really is responsible, I, I fully believe, for, for the resurgence of, of uh, and, and awareness of art in this city. And, and other people, of, of course, have contributed. Fine Arts Commission has done his job, but Janelle is one, uh, and she's do, still doing art consulting, but she deserves a great deal of credit, so thank you, Janelle. Now you've got her cheering up. There's just a big cry fest around here today. <laughs> All right, this is the part of the program where I get lazy and you get to ask the questions. Anybody have a question for Stan? Okay, I gotta ask one. When you gave that painting to the Sight and Sound fundraiser, that first box painting. Yes. And, and it's only because I'm a mercenary and the fundraiser around here. <coughs> Do you remember the, the amount of money that was bid to win that painting? I, I, I didn't hear what you he, How much was bid to win that first painting? Do you remember? Well, yes, yeah, so the bid was five, it was, yes, yeah, $5,000. Would you be willing to give one? <laughs> <laughs> Get in line, man. <laughs> Other less selfish questions for Stan. <laughs> Stan, you started at high school, leaving high school and college. Can you say anything about your early life and what maybe inspired you to pursue art to begin with? Well, uh, you know, I was one of those kids that always was drawing. My parents made sure that I had drawing materials. They subscribed to one of those correspondence courses like you see on Matchbooks, Draw Me, you know. <laughs> So they, they uh, subscribed to that for me. I remember the first art class I took was uh, in high school when I was a senior. And the art teacher brought in her own personal oil, uh, set of oils for me to use and encouraged me. And then I found that I used to hang out at the art department at the college uh, and uh, when, when the uh, family would, would drive into Lincoln, I would go to the University Art Museum and check that out. And prior to all that, uh, uh, there was a time we lived in Omaha for a short period of time. And my older sister used to take me to Jocelyn and walk me by the hand through the, through the holes of, of Jocelyn. So I was sort of exposed to art. And plus, uh, I had an aunt who was an artist, so it must be in the gene pool. Unfortunately, I did not know that aunt. They, they lived in California, so I didn't know them. Uh, but, uh, and, in, and when I was in grade school, I remember we were doing, the, one of the classes was going to do a, a play and they needed a, a, a scene of a cornfield. And I remember a piece of white <coughs> wrapping paper, I guess, or something. I, 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 I was commissioned to do <laughs> <laughs> corn stalks. Uh, and that, uh, so, so I, was, I was encouraged all, all the way along. And of course in college I was an art major and uh, so, it, it's, it's, it, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Question here? Well, I'm sure I got all the 
chronology correct? I think you said 25 years you had your own studio, and it sounds like Mount Vernon Road and 34th Street, right? Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> then after 25 years, did you go back to doing artistry just in your home? Yes. Yes. I, uh, yeah. I resurrected the studio, and that's that's where I do. That's where it works today. Uh, and uh, I, I, I have no affiliation with any galleries at the moment. Uh, however, Janelle has been very kind to represent me. And uh, uh, sometimes people just come to me directly. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I, as long as I can come up with ideas, uh, you know, I'll, I suppose I will continue uh, painting. One thing that I sort of fabricated after I, well, actually I started this even before I closed the gallery, but I began doing uh, small paintings for greeting cards and uh, thinking that was a good way to just keep me busy. <coughs> and so I, I continue to do those. And they're available in a variety of places. Here. When you close the gallery, you mentioned that you want to do some writing. How's that going at all? Again, I. I uh, writing. Are you doing any writing? Oh. Uh, uh, I'm not doing any writing at the moment. That, that was uh, something I got involved with. Uh, it goes clear back to graduate school, uh, to finish my uh, MFA, I had to take three hours outside the department. And I, in just browsing through the, the catalog, trying to find something, I noticed a, a seminar in, in creative writing. And so I decided, well, that sounds interesting, <laughs> you know, pinball. And uh, so I went and, and signed up. The, the, unfortunately, the class was full. Uh, but the, the assistant said, stick around the prof. I talked to the prof, and he'll maybe let you in. So I, I talked to him. I said, I have absolutely no credentials to, to get into your seminar. I, I, you know, I, I don't write. I don't read extensively. I have nothing. It's just that I, I, I have to take three hours somewhere. And, <laughs> and that was I a said, good oh, pitch, Stan. <laughs> I said that there is one thing. I can lie convincingly. <laughs> and I, I said that seriously. And he said, I'm going to let you in the class. And he did. And it turned out to be one of the... Uh, Just hang on a second. I'll get there. I, I, I'm going to tell a, a mini detour. I have a short story by Stan Wiederspan on my desk at Hancher Auditorium. I keep it there to be annoyed that he's so good at writing in addition to being such a good visual artist, right? Because I write for a living, and I don't do it nearly as well as he does. How you doing over there? I'm fine now. OK. Thank you. <laughs> But, but I was going to say, and in some ways, that was the single best educational experience I've ever had, that one class in the writer's workshop. And I'll tell you why. See if I can make it through this. The, it was a seminar, and it was a graduate level seminar. So assume, of course, certain things are assumed of the students in the class. But as the class assembled, the instructor began the class not by reminding us of the technique for writing the stories, that, uh, the technique for proper grammar, so on and so forth. He assembled the group and said, tell me a story. As simple as that, tell me a story, which he, in saying that, he said to each of us, I'm trusting you that you have a story and the ability to do it. Just do it. Just write it down and share it. Well, think about a young artist. If somebody says, just paint me a picture. And, and one of the questions I thought would come tonight is, you know, how do you start? What do you do? My answer is just start. 
just start. Don't, don't necessarily feel that there are absolute rules that you have to learn. All of that can come later. Just start. And so uh, I began writing and, and wrote a number of pieces, thoroughly enjoying them. In fact, there are many times when I just grab the portfolio and read them and entertain myself and laugh and try. Uh, but somewhere along the line, um, I, I seem to get discouraged about it. And uh, I, I, a friend of mine is a writer, and I think the seriousness with which they approach writing diminished my the feeling that I, uh, I could do it, you know, as I, and, and uh, I wish I could start again because I really, really loved it. And there were times I'd get so excited about writing uh, that it, it was more important than painting to me. So I, I but I, at the moment, I, I, I'm not doing any more writing. I think I heard a, a, a wise man once say that if you want to start writing again, Stan, you should just start. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's true. But. John. Yes. You've got the beginning of your life story right here. We've just heard it. You just take what you've said, write it down, and expand on it as you like. You've got a winner. I know a guy who would help you work on your memoir, Stephen. <laughs> Actually, what I, what I would like to do is take those stories that I've written so far and maybe get started again and then put together a, a portfolio of them and self-publish uh, a few of them. Uh, so many of them are, are based on, on actual situations. They're fictionalized, uh, but they're based on, on actual situations, many of which happened in the gallery. Uh, you know, and, and so, you know, on those days when only the postman came in, I had a yellow pad, if I was in painting, writing down stories that happened. And, uh, um, good title. Very good title. It happened in the gallery. Hmm. <laughs> Say what? You could call the collection It Happened in the Gallery. Well, but, yeah, that, that's true, but some, some of them are beyond the gallery. <laughs> you know, they're, they're... So many things are. We're going to take a couple more. Paul. Yeah, Stan, um, in Apt Iowa Wesleyan, in one of the stairwells, there's a wonderful mosaic by you. Can you give any stories attached to that? Was that done when you were a professor at Iowa Wesley? Yes. Um, they, when I arrived on campus, they were just in the process of uh, getting ready to build uh, a new library. And uh, in, in some way, I. I just became aware of these plans, and uh, here was this big wall behind this. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you know, let, let's do something on that wall. And uh, uh, I've sort of forgotten exactly, but it turned out that, that they said, fine, design it. And uh, so I did. Uh, and it was executed in uh, mosaic tiles, ceramic tiles, mm -hmm. little one-inch ceramic tiles. And I remember I went to New York, uh, to Rochester, New York, I think, to talk to the, the tile people uh, uh, to get ready to bring that. The problem is that the, the stairway, of course, cuts it, so you don't, you, it's impossible to see the whole thing. But the idea behind it was uh, paramecium's, uh, single cell animals 
Uh, I just remembered that from college uh, biology. And so there were a couple of paramecium swooping around the idea that the one cell animals would be getting a life as is the library. Thank you. You know, so. There was a question in the way back, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask, you said you agreed with your professor when he said that you didn't understand art. What was it you decided you didn't understand about art? He was referencing your story about the professor who said they didn't think you understood art. What do you understand about art now? That's a very challenging question, of course, and it, and it would, it, 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 you know, it, it's, a, it's worth a lot of discussion. And perhaps some of you, we've got a number of outstanding artists here in the, in the audience. They may please chime in if you have some thoughts about it. I, I, I dislike the idea of trying to box something in so absolutely. The Royal Academies in Europe did that. And the, the significance of the, of the Impressionists was that they said, we, we don't want to adhere to the Royal Academy. We're going to go our own way. And so they began painting in new ways. They began to show, let the brush stroke show. They began piling up the impasto, piling up texture. They began to look at subject matter in a different way. So they break, broke the whole code of what art had been. And of course, it was prior to the invention of the camera that it was artists who, who uh, recorded history visually uh, and, and did portraits and all that sort of thing. Once the camera came in and took over and could do that, that liberated artists to find all sorts of new ways to work. And it is true that artists have the capacity to reproduce exactly photorealistically what they see, but there are also many avenues beyond that uh, that uh, are considered art. And, and I'll, I'll briefly tell you one of my favorite stories from the gallery. Do we have time? We do, we have time. Well, yeah. this, this is a quick story. A lady came into the gallery, looked around, and uh, when she passed a particular painting, it was an abstract by Richard, Richard Dunn, an abstract uh, watercolor. Without looking at it the third time, she pointed to it and said, I would not have that, anything like that in my house. <laughs> and I said, well, would, would you mind if I told you something about the painting? And I said, it's an abstraction. Don't look at it and try to find subjects, like you look at the moon, look at the cloud and try to find the horse and the rider. It's, there, it's not there. It's a picture of paint. It's a picture of color and what those things do. And uh, try to listen to the painting. And I put it out in an area where the colors were really quite soft. And I said, if this were a symphony, this would be where the violins are playing some Debussy, perhaps. But on this part of the painting, the, the paint and the color gets very, very strong. Uh, and, and you can hear the brass coming in and the percussion coming in. Uh, and then look at the whole thing, and you, now you're beginning to hear all of the music. You're hearing the whole symphony sweep you. Look at the painting and let it sweep you. That's what it's about. And she said, no one has ever explained that to me. I'll buy the painting. And she did. <laughs> I recognize that very lesson. A certain freelance writer may have walked into the gallery and gotten that very same lesson without buying a painting. Yeah. So to, to try to answer your question, that I think it's really wide open. It's wide open. And so much is being done today, you look at it and you just shake your head, but they shook their head at the Impressionists. Mm -hmm. So, so there. So there. All right, so we have a question that we ask every guest. 
it's sort of designed to give you the opportunity to cry. So I wanted to like <laughs> warn you about that. And that question is this. Stan, if you could give your younger self some advice, what would that advice be? Well, at that point, the advice would have been to consider broader possibilities in going to, to college. In other words, I, I think in many ways much of my art has a very strong graphic design undertow to it. And I think had I been advised or someone had introduced the idea of going to an art school, which my parents could not have afforded, uh, and, and going into graphic design, I think I may have done that and, and might have been a more successful graphic designer than I am a painter. I, uh, you know, I, I have evolved as a painter and I'm very happy to have done that and it has been relatively successful but I may have gone down a different path, had more opportunities been laid out in front of me to think about. So. You got through that and you didn't shed a single tear. It would have been our artistic loss though if Stan had become a graphic designer. I love graphic designers, but Stan, <laughs> we love your work. <laughs> We Thank love you your work. We also love that you all turned out here tonight. If you are not a member of the History Center yet, I encourage you to become a member of the History Center. It helps us do these sorts of programs, as does Mike Wilson, who is the sponsor of Oral Histories Live. And with that, join me in thanking my friend, Stan. <laughs>